Sir Shane Roberts, who will be my special guest this evening. Come on up. Go ahead, take a seat. Okay. All right. My pants are a little tight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, Sir Shane, tell us a little bit about your growing up and uh, your, the circumstances of your family. I come from a very large family. I'm one of 14 kids. I am directly in the middle. Uh, there are 13 of us left. I did have a brother who passed away in 1982 from full blown AIDS before anybody knew what AIDS was. He was one of the unfortunate beginners. So, um, grew up in Detroit, Michigan. I was born in California, grew up in Detroit, spent eight years in Houston, Texas. Uh, moved back to Detroit. I've been in the Detroit metro area ever since, unless I'm in Indy. <laughs> That's about it in a nutshell. You, you mentioned your brother passing very early on in the AIDS crisis. How was your family able to cope with that when at that time there was very little infrastructure available? It was extremely rough. Um, it, 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 even so much as where to have him buried and what funeral home to put him at because at that time nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. Um, he was actually not allowed to be have the funeral in Catholic Church um, to find a funeral home to um, present his body and have the service there was quite a trying experience at the time. I mean, this is right at the beginning of the crisis. It was tough. What, what sorts of complications did your family experience from that? Prejudices? Oh, absolute prejudice, um, like the plague. Uh, you know, it's to try and explain to people that it's not contagious through bodily contact, it's not contagious if somebody breathes on you. Uh, at the time, obviously, nobody knew what all was involved with it, but it was, um, it was, the, it was the, the bubonic plague of the 80s, it really was. Uh, you know, people didn't, um, they judged you even more because of that situation, they judged the family and um, a, a lot of discrimination, a lot. How did you see that situation evolve over the years? Oh, it's gotten so much better. <laughs> so much better. Um, I, I am, Ms. Kendra and I have, have talked about this many times in, at different events, and I have publicly spoken about it at events in Detroit, that in today's, today's community has always had HIV as part of their life. They were born into it. And when you experience full-blown AIDS from the onset and, and you don't know it, it's the very same thing of, I grew up with the rotary dial telephone. Who would think that you'd have a cell phone that you'd be able to communicate, you know, so many years later, it, it's that you're, you were born into it. So to, I wasn't born into it, but I experienced it firsthand, as did my family and so many others of my, my leather family. I mean, it, it's... It's tough. You you don't know the the fights that have gone to to understand it, to remedy it, to accept it. Acceptance has the, the, been the hardest thing I think over the past forty years. I really do. You were married, and you have a daughter. Tell us a bit about that. Um, I was married when I was eighteen years old. Um, my daughter is now. 40 something. I don't want to get too much my age way, but I was very young when I started. Uh, I do have two grandchildren, as a matter of fact. Um, looking back at it, um, it, it was an experience. It was something that I don't regret doing because it made me who I am today to have that experience. I ran into, I think I talked to you about this, uh, about. My ex-wife and I were divorced when my daughter was five. And when my daughter was 30, I happened to be in a restaurant in Royal Oak, Michigan. Um, I worked for a retail company and we were doing a construction remodel project in the store. So on the last day of the project, I took the temporary crew and I said, you guys, 
work the rest of the week, wherever you want to go, we're going to go out to dinner on me. They waited, so we made arrangements. We're sitting, we walk into the restaurant, and we're sitting at a table. Three guys across the table from me. The waitress comes over and she stands there and she takes their order. My daughter's name is Cheryl Lynn. That's not a very common name. And the guy sitting across the table looks at her and says, well, Cheryl Lynn, I'll have this. And he starts flirting with her. And I took one look over and she's standing right here. And I took one look over. I had not seen my daughter in 25 years. And I took one look at her and I said, Cheryl Lynn Turner. And she looked at me and she goes, I know exactly who you are. That's probably the most bizarre moment I've ever had in my life. Because I then turned around and said, you laid one fucking finger on her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it just goes to show how small the world really is. Because I really didn't think, we, we had not had any contact since then. Um, one time we did have uh, one brief encounter of contact because she was in trouble. and. Here's Daddy. I'm going to take care of her. But um, I, I do miss the opportunity to have, to have watched her grow up, go through school, make a life for herself. Um, you know, I, I was there. I was not there for my granddaughter's birthday, either one of them. But it's okay. She knows how to get a hold of me, and if the need be, the need will be. I, I find that a number of people in our community have children or have been married. What are your thoughts on that and how that impacts people within the LGBTQ community? I think in today's society is much more accepted. I was very fortunate. Um, my ex-wife and I did not separate on bad terms. She knew at the time that I was um, bisexual I, as how I would consider myself to be at the time if I was going to put a label on myself. Um, it was it was not the demise, that was not the reason the marriage didn't work. Um, the marriage didn't work for a number of reasons: financial, age difference. She's 11 years older than I am. Um, society in general, uh, you know, I do I do have to believe that um, we were married in 1979 and divorced in 1980. To. So it was right around the time that my brother had passed away. They, you know, 14 kids, everybody's kind of close at the time because the age ranges were pretty tight. And I think that took maybe a toll on the marriage and her not understanding of what was going through with the family as well. Um, but I think that the, I, I, I find myself fortunate that she was accepting of the fact that I was free enough and knew who I was to be able to express express my sexual freedom and and play when necessary. And that's the way I would put it. I think that in today's world, it's much more accepted um, because the walls have been broken down, the communication levels are there, and there's not tolerance for dislike. I mean, you know, it, I really do think that the acceptance is there much more today than what it was. How did you come out into the um, leather kink community? Um, as early as 1979 when I was a senior in high school. Uh, there was a bar in Detroit. Um, I think you and I talked about this as well. Um, it eventually turned into the Detroit Eagle. Uh, it was called the Interchange. And the underground um, communication of being young and wild at uh, 18 years old, it's like, oh, bright, shiny thing. Let me try this out. Um, that, that's pretty much my first exposure was very underground. It was not, um, even in the late 70s and early 80s in Detroit, there was not a leather scene. It was um, very much, um, what we would say today, techno club, um, and very much the drag scene in Detroit. Um, there were a, there were two 
leather bars that I can distinctly recall. One would be the R and R, the original, and um, the second one would be the interchange. Um, so late at night, unbeknownst to uh, friends, colleagues, people I hung out with, I would go to the back room of the leather bars after hours and party hardy. I, I'm terrified to ask what you did there. <laughs> well, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Um, the original R&R &R was on Michigan Avenue. And um, the owner of the R&R &R just passed away a year ago. And her name was Ruby. And Ruby was the first gay bar um, to put a pool table in her bar. Okay, and that pool table, till the day they closed their doors a couple of years ago, still stood in the newer R&R, &R, and if that pool table could talk. <laughs> I'm kind of glad it's not available, because I might have to buy it. <laughs> yeah. should, should it go to the leather archives then? Um, it could. <laughs> It could. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about the, the gay life that you knew in the early days in Detroit. What other places did you visit, or did you visit other cities that also had? Um, I would say that once I felt really comfortable with who I was and where I wanted to go, I would say that New York and Chicago were both of my favorite haunts. Um, the mine shaft in um, New York. Um, Chicago is probably a little bit closer to home where I probably would feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, New York at the time, I would say, was probably too big of a world for me, if that makes sense. Uh, it was just too hustle and bustle and too, um, I, I'm not sure what word I want to describe it with, but way too, way too busy, way too busy. Um, I didn't get to L.A. until I was later on in years. Um, Chicago and New York, outside of Detroit, were probably the two places that I would venture the most. Tell us a bit about your time with the mine shaft. You mentioned that a moment ago. Um, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> All the more reason. This is, I hope this isn't too, making too much noise. But So what, is, is there anywhere that stands out as in, in other than the mine shaft, how about in Chicago? Were there places that you've frequented that aren't there anymore? Um, not that I can, not that I can easily remember. Um, I didn't get there a lot when I was younger. Um, I haven't actually been there since um, 2005, so it's been a few years since I've been there. But um, I, I can't really think that there was any place that I would make. My, my, my home visit and whenever I would go. I, I really can't think of it. What were your motivations toward the leather community? What drew you there? The mystique behind it, the brotherhood behind it, the comradeship and the true self-awareness that was brought to me that it's okay to be different, it's okay to be kinky, it's okay to relate to one another on a, a specific level. And, and I don't mean that just on a sexual nature. I mean, I was taught very early on, and those of you that know me well enough know that Hurt is H-I-R-T, and it's honor, integrity, respect, and truth. And that's a code that I have instilled in my life for many, many, many years. And I try to teach it. Um, they're important traits to have. And I'm fortunate that I was able to learn those in my early days of leather from some upstanding people who unfortunately are no longer with us, but they in turn left their own legacy. 
Are there significant differences between the leather community you knew at that time versus what we know now? I, I do believe there is. Um, I think the core values have gotten a little bit lost through the years. Um, we're reminded through events such as GLLA um, that those values are there and they are to be talked about and not to be forgotten. Um, I have a favorite saying that, that is, don't ever forget where your roots are because where your roots are is where you're going to end up and where, where you come from and what you can, what you can relate to others and, and teach and share the experiences with are, are good things. Okay. You also mentioned um, LIFE, life. What is that? Life um, is an organization, and I still say is because technically they are still an organization. Life stands for Leather Institute for Education in Detroit. And it was an organization that was uh, founded in 2003 by Lovardo of California, Diamond Jim Brown of Detroit, and Dale Ross of Detroit. Um, and I was invited, uh, that was my title year for Mr. Leather, Michigan. I was invited to attend the initial meeting of that, and it was just a few of us sitting around a table in a bar talking about we need to get a group and an organization together. And um, through my title year, I didn't have a lot of involvement with it. And then uh, Lovardo moved uh, from Detroit to California. Uh, Dale Ross um, has, still resides in the Detroit area, and so does Diamond Jim Brown. And um, over the years, it would be a weekly meeting, and you know we would have a bar night at Diamond Jim's, and it, it was just a place to congregate and to gather, and then it became the true educational forum. And then after Lovardo moved uh, from Detroit to L.A., um, Jim, Diamond Gem sold the, uh, was thinking about selling Diamond Gem Saloon. So um, a couple of us that had been at the meetings regularly and became more and more involved um, approached Jim and said, we would like to take over Life Detroit because he was going to step back from it. So a group of um, six of us got together and we actually incorporated it. And uh, we took it to places where Jim and um, Dale never thought it would go. We were nominated for Pantheon of Leather Community, small leather events. Um, we've had some fantastic speakers at some events. We also founded Dark Weekend, which stood for Detroit Area Rough and Kink Fest Weekend that had a run of six years. Um, Life Detroit Anniversary had a run of 12 years, I think. Um, and through life, unfortunately, um, you know, people wean off and they get other interests and things. And unfortunately, I will say that the leather scene in Detroit has pretty much gone to the side of where major cities now do in the leather lifestyle. It's not as existent as what we would like it to be. Um, I myself um, was the board president of Life Detroit for two terms. The second, the first term, I did step down. Um, because there was a, an opportunity presented to Life Detroit from the Leather Leadership Conference. And uh, I, Mrs. P Mistress Pandora, and um, I cannot think of his name now, uh, from Pontiac, um, headed up the board for the Leather Leadership Conference, and we brought it to Detroit. And it was the first ever international conference because we involved Canada, which is right across the river. <laughs> So they had tried to do that, and um, they been try had tried for many years to do an international event, and we offered that opportunity. Well, with that, uh, Life Detroit was going to be the beneficiary of some of the funds that were raised from that conference, and I did not want any hindrance by being a, a, the president of the board with that, so I stepped down from the board so that I could get full concentration because it is a three-year process for the Leather Leadership Conference. You have to get awarded it, you have, you have to apply for it, then it gets reviewed by the board, you have to go to the, to, to the event and be interviewed. It, it's a long, lengthy process, and when we were awarded it, I made the decision right then and there. I'm going to step down, 
because I didn't want the possibility of somebody saying, well, there's nepotism. Okay. So um, we had the conference, it was very successful. Um, I let the pro tem um, president continue his term and then everybody begged me to come back, so I did. Um, unfortunately, um, technically, I guess I'm still the president. Uh, we have not had a meeting of Life Detroit as an organization in probably three or four years. And I'm not proud to say that, but when the audience isn't there, who do you reach out to? Let's take a step back. You mentioned a moment ago Dark Weekend. Please uh, fill us in a little bit about that. What was that? About the what? Dark Weekend. Dark Weekend. Detroit area rough game fest. <laughs> Uh, very much a, a new concept for Detroit, had not been done before. We had uh, vendors, classrooms, um, educational speakers. Um, it was always held on Super Bowl weekend, so it was always the first weekend in February. And then uh, the first three were very successful, and even though we ran it into Sunday, we were done by noon so everybody could go to the Super Bowl parties. <laughs> But uh, it was great because we, uh, we were fortunate to have a, um, a banquet hall that supported another group in uh, Detroit in the leather community uh, for their annual runs. So we propositioned them and they said, come on. And uh, Almada Hall was our venue for quite a few years. Um, completely closed down for us, let us do what we wanted, when we wanted, no restrictions. Um, Lou, who was one of the, we awarded Lou the last year of our event there because they sold the, the uh, they sold the hall. And so we awarded her with a honorary piece of leather and I thought the woman was gonna fall over. She, but but in, in mainstream society to see a person that accepting of uh, of just something that would just be the total opposite of who she is was pretty unbelievable. She welcomed us with open arms. Uh, we then moved the venue to a Knights of Columbus Hall in Lincoln Park, Michigan, who is operated by the former chief of police of Lincoln Park. Wow. And we could do just about anything we wanted there as well. <laughs> the only thing that he f put his foot down and said there will be no sexual acts on this premises whatsoever. Yes, sir. No problem. Um, so we, we we had some we had some good times with our Detroit because it was uh, it was a new event and everybody likes new um, and it was interesting because we had some we had some really good keynote speakers. So you know um, we actually had Chuck Rentler uh, one. We had uh, Jack Ranella. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you some of the, some of the, the star-studded names, but these are people that are real in the community, so it was important. It really was important. Are you currently involved in any organizations, clubs? I, I currently am not. Great Lakes Leather Alliance is my baby. I have been for uh, a few years. <laughs> <laughs> what was, uh, tell us about Leatherosity. Um, Leatherosity was founded uh, by my boy Gino and myself. And this came about, um, there is one leather store in the city of Detroit, and it's called Noir Leather. And Keith has been the owner of Noir Leather for easily 45 years. Um, it's the only place where you really could go to buy leather, and very expensive. And those that were interested in buying new to go to Nord Leather. Um, Boy Gino and I uh, came up with an idea of, you know what, why don't we open a leather and fetish store? So we did this in a flea market. And our weekends were spent. We first started Leatherosity with a curb table, about six pair of jeans, 501s, a couple pair of boots, some leather vests, and these were all used items. So our trademark on Leatherosity was Leatherosity, not so sloppy seconds. <laughs> 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 
And anybody that knows my boy knows he is very meticulous and looks for every flaw that could be on anything. So we spent many days going through thrift stores, estate sales, looking online for lot closeouts. And we took a 12 by 12 space and within five years we're up to, to th within the first five years we were up to three spaces of 12 by 12 and within six years we were up to nine spaces at 12 by 12. We sold uh, used denim for five dollar a pair. We sold um, military uniforms, both vintage and new. We signed a contract with the military supplier Boots, fetish gear, fetish implements, restraints, you name it, we sold it. If we didn't have it, we knew where to get it. Um, the, and, and we didn't sell it for a huge markup price, and that's what made us unique, was we had many people that would come visit us at the store because they were interested in, they saw something that somebody else had, hey, where'd you get that? I got that at Leatherosity. And, um, they would come in and they would refer friends and, and the best form of advertising is word of mouth. And um, before you know it, we had some, some, some interesting people come in through our doors. Uh, there was an article done for a local um, gay magazine that was done on Leatherosity and they just heard about us through word of mouth and they came out and checked it out. The woman that has a booth right behind where we were located, where we did our final expansion to, is an adult novelty uh, store. So we became real good friends. We would refer customers to each other. Um, it, it, was, it was a great experience because people, we would give people the cost or the, the price that they were gonna pay for something, and let's face it, you know, bundling is good. Okay, you're going to buy two or three pieces, we're going to give you a better price. And when they started to realize that this was a no holds barred, no judgment pass zone, we got some good, we got some good repeat customers. So it, it was good. Uh, Boy Gino has since retired. Uh, my life partner passed away almost two years ago. I have been promoted in my job, so I work seven days a week. And it's, you know, we had to make a decision, what are we gonna do, right, you know? So mm -hmm. the best interest is that, that we closed on July 1st, unfortunately, but we have, we have some great memories. And if anybody's interested in buying some surplus merchandise, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of this here. I appreciate that, absolutely. So I hope this isn't making too much noise. Um, what are your thoughts on mentoring in the community? That's a very big topic for us. There can never be too many. There's not enough. Um, some of that is through design and some of that is through circumstance. Circumstance would be some of the, um, almost all of my mentors are no longer here. Um, but I, I, I do have to say that you're never, it's never too late to be mentored. Um, there are people that I feel that we run across in our daily journey of life and they end up to be your mentor, whether it's for the minute, whether it's for the rest of your life together, whether it is just in passing. Um, mentoring and learning go hand in hand. Um, I, I can't begin to tell you how much I have learned from so many people in this very room itself. That's, that's true. Is there anything you wish you had learned earlier on? <laughs> um, I would say no, because um, what I know now could have killed me then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> if you could go back in your leather journey, is is there anything you would change that you would do differently? No. I, I firmly believe that things happen for a reason at the time they are, they are, they happen. They happen for a reason, there's a time for everything to happen. I do not, I don't ever look back and say, would I have done something different because it was meant to be at the time. Um, 
a lot of my inner strength has come from not necessarily the wisest choices at the time, but that's how you learn from things that you might have been able to do differently, but you don't know until you do it. You don't know. It's not, there's not an instruction manual to get through life. So I wouldn't read it anyways. But. <laughs> I'm sure we have title holders here and people who will be participating in the contests this weekend. What advice have you for them? Be who you are. Be true to who you are. Have respect for yourself. Have respect for one another. Have respect for the lifestyle. Have a true understanding of what you were getting yourself into. <laughs> it's not, um, I can tell you from first-hand experience, and I know things have changed over the years. It's been um, a few years since I was a title holder um, in the public venue as a title holder. And um, my partner, the first year, became a sash widow. And it's true. Um, but he also knew my commitment for myself and for eventually would become the commitment I had for the community. It afforded me a voice that was a little bit stronger by having the title behind my name. Um, be sure this is what you want to do. This, this title will follow you forever, forever. Am I right, Ms. Constance? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. What's the biggest misconception about you? You know, I, I, I really didn't have an answer for that when you and I talked briefly a few months ago. So I did a survey at work. <laughs> 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 and I got some quizzical answers. The biggest misconception about me is until you know me, I come across as disinterested, I come across as angry, I come across as stuck up, I come across as, don't bother him. <laughs> Those of you that do know me know that is far the thing from the truth. Um, I've been, I, I've been, told those things to my face. What the real truth behind that is, I'm very intense. I'm extremely intense. I may be seem disinterested, I may seem aloof, I may seem stuck up. I'm just very intense. I am surveying the situation. I am thinking 24-7. And it, there, there's a difference, and, and I wouldn't change it either. I really wouldn't. It makes, it makes people keep guessing. 